and welcome back. And I don't actually have that many microcomputers in this room. I'm mostly mini computer focused. What with the Centurion and its printer taking up an entire wall. We've got the Data 620 that's taller than I am. The Bendix G15 that weighs a literal thousand pounds. We have a PDP 1144 with its epic Fujitsu Eagle hard drive. And we have the Litton mini computer looking a bit like a washing machine. I love these large scale systems because they give me a window into computing that the normal person would never have been able to see otherwise. But I also find microcomputers fascinating. And I have a few in here. I've got the TI 994 with its insane train of sidecars. I've got the Deck Rainbow, which has an 8080 and a Z80 stuffed inside of it. And the EDS PC over here, which has a really fascinating story behind it. We're gonna get deep into that as soon as I get all of the requisite components to bring it up properly in hand. But there is one more microcomputer that I want to get into, and that is this one right here. This is an NEC PC8001. And this one's pretty special to me because it's the first microcomputer that I bought, which is a strange thing for somebody like me to say, but as a kid, we didn't really get into the microcomputer revolution, which isn't to say that I'm super young and missed it. As you can tell by the gray hair, I'm definitely a product of the 80s, but <laughs> We, as a family, just didn't get into computing until the 386 was a thing. Then I got the bug. Throughout my entire uh, childhood, teenage years, young adult life, and even into an adult, I was always fascinated with the newest, hottest computer that was coming out. I always tried to build a pretty wicked gaming PC, and it isn't until recently that I thought, you know what, I should go back and see what all the hubbub was about in the 1980s. And of course, that led to the 70s, Centurion, the 60s, the Data 620, and the 50s, the Bendix G15. It was kind of a bit of a rabbit hole that I fell down there. But back to this NEC PC 8001, when I was getting interested in maybe diving back into this retro computing scene, I was on a business trip to Japan and I was in Akihabara visiting a pretty cool shop called Beep. And I was wandering around and I started asking the uh, attendants there what the potentially the oldest Japanese personal computer would be. And they pointed me at this NEC PC 8001. Now, this isn't technically the oldest Japanese personal computer. I think the master basic system uh, beat it by a year. But to me, this one's pretty special because it looks way cooler than the master basic system. <laughs> Now, I got this all the way back in 2018. I never got it working. I took it apart, cleaned it up, made it look real nice, and then it sat in a corner for the next six years. So it's time to get to it. It's time to turn this thing into a functioning microcomputer that we can then put here in this room, if I can find space for it. <laughs> So I have no idea if it works. I have no idea how this episode is going to go. This is a literal unknown. I know nothing about this system. As I mentioned earlier, I picked this up at Beep Akihabara. So this is a proper PC8001 without the A. The 8001A is the one that we got here in the States. And so that means that it has a unique keyboard. You can see it has all of the Japanese katakana written on the keys. And you can switch between the two with this kana button right here, which is a uh, latching switch, which means that it's also going to have some custom ROMs inside to support the Japanese characters. Now, when I got it, there were a few things that came with it, like this little sticker here that says NEC PC 8001 and has the uh, serial number on it. And then we also got this little uh, pamphlet right here, which has the original warranty card in it, I believe, uh, which you can see says PC 8001, has the serial number on it right there. You fill this out, it has multiple carbon copies like this, and then you can mail that in. That's that's pretty cool to see that stuff with it, but I think the really fascinating stuff is going to be inside of it. So let's pull this top off. I've had this uh, part before for cleaning, so this isn't exactly new to me, but we'll go ahead and pull the top off here. You can see I've already got the keyboard disconnected. These two normally plug in right down around here. Uh, the power supply I've also got completely disconnected. So we'll just go ahead and pull it completely out of the way. And there we go. That is the motherboard. That's the whole computer. Before we dive into the motherboard, I do want to take a quick look at the underside of the keyboard here. I do believe that this is a purely mechanical keyboard, but that's not what I'm really fascinated by. What I am is the string of numbers right here, 56.5.19. 
this is actually the build date of this machine. But that seems really strange. What year was it built in? 1956? 2056? How do we know that this is the build date? Well, in Japan, the official way to write down the current year is to write down what year of the current emperor's reign it is. So right now we're in the Beiwa era. Before that, it was the Heisei era. And before that, it was the Showa era. And the emperor during the Showa era was Emperor Hirohito, and he reigned from 1926 to 1989. And this machine was built in the 56th year of Emperor Hirohito's reign, which equates to 1981. So we have to do a little bit of math to figure out what year this was actually built. Now the NEC PC 8001, I believe, was released in 1979. So this is a fairly late model of it. It had been on sale for three years by this time. Looking closer at the motherboard here, it's pretty obvious that NEC had their own chip fab going on. All of the big chips here are NEC made. But looking at the heavy hitters, right here we've got the D780C. This is the NEC made Z80 CPU. Right above it, we have a D8257. I believe that this is a CRT controller. It might be a DMA controller. And on that topic, the uh, one over here is a D3301. This might be a CRT controller or a DMA controller. I couldn't find clear data sheets on these and just looking at the schematics, one of them is doing that and the other one is doing something. So that's how they go. Uh, right above the D3301 is a D8251, uh, which is a communications interface. Uh, right here, we've got D2364s, three of them right in a row, and they say in basic on them. So these are gonna be the custom Japanese basic ROMs. Uh, and then finally, these are D416Cs. These are all 16K by one bit DRAMs. There are eight in a row, so that's gonna be uh, 16 kilobytes and then another 16 kilobytes for a total of 32K of RAM. But, uh, you know, I've been ignoring the giant elephant in the room, which is this strange perf board that's just kind of hanging off to the edge here. The previous owner in Japan, whoever they were, designed this modification board. And there are wires all along the bottom of the motherboard here that go to a ton of different ICs. So I have absolutely no clue what this does. It looks like it has a little LED on there and it has a little push button switch. No clue what this is gonna be for. I'm hoping that once we get this powered up and uh, plugged into a monitor, that can give us a little bit of insight uh, as to what it does. Now, before we throw some electrons at this thing, there's a couple of precautions that we're gonna have to take. And the first is with the power supply. I've already pulled the top off of it here and you can see it is a switch mode power supply and it looks really clean inside. There's no reefas or anything that I think we need to worry about, except for the fact that Japan's power grid is only 100 volts, whereas here in America, we're at 120 volts. Now, 100 volts seems really strange, but if you look at the back of any cell phone charger that you have, you'll see that it often says 100 to 240 volts. That 100 is so that it can be compatible with Japan's power grid. Now, Japan's power grid still has one more trick up its sleeve, but it actually works out in our favor here. Japan is split between two different types of power grids. One half of the country is on 50 hertz, the other half of the country is on 60 hertz. Pretty wild for a country the size of California to have that, but what this means is that every piece of electronics equipment that comes out of Japan has to be compatible with both 50 and 60 hertz. So we don't need to worry about having a different line frequency with this particular power supply. But the increased voltage here in America is a bit of a concern because you're going to get raw AC coming in through here. This looks like our full bridge rectifier here. We have some 100 microfarad, 160 volt smoothing capacitors after that. And then we get into the switch mode section of it after there. And then there's a bunch of smaller electrolytics on the end. But those all look in really fantastic shape. I think we can just send it as long as we get the proper 100 volts into it. And for that, just to be extra safe, I'm going to use an inverter that takes 120 volts and drops it down to 100 volts AC. Switch mode power supplies actually need to load on them before they uh, stabilize to the correct voltage. And uh, I happen to know that this power supply is in pretty good shape because, you know, I do stuff off camera to make sure that I don't look like a complete fool, but we'll test it anyways. I'll go ahead and flip the power on here. And then we'll go ahead and check the voltage rails. This should be plus five volts right here. 
4.97, that's looking good. It should be plus 12, 12.6, and minus 12.2. This thing is putting out all the perfect voltages. That is excellent news. On the back here, we can get a look at uh, some of the ports here. We've got our AC 100 volt. This is where the actual AC line plug is gonna come out the back. This is where the power switch goes. That's this little guy right here. Uh, and it, underneath it, it says uh, DIN GAN, and then you have on and off. This says uh, reset, so this is our reset switch. This has a little cap that goes on it that's off of it right now so that I don't uh, break it off while moving around. Then we have a cassette port. Then these two ports are for display. This one says uh, shirokuro, which is black, white, and this one says color. Uh, and then over here on the right, we've got printer and uh, gaibu bus or external bus. But the reason that we're back here is that I need to plug this into a monitor and the monitor that I have that goes with this is a composite monitor. And you can see that there is not a composite plug on the back here. However, I think there is composite video coming out of this uh, black and white port for the display here. I just need to figure out which pin is which because if there's uh, 12 volts on here and I hook up the wrong pin, I can uh, absolutely damage the monitor. So we'll start in the top right and move our way around in a clockwise fashion. And uh, let's see here, top right looks like it's off the scale here. And yeah, that's gonna be a solid 12 volts coming into that. So top right is gonna be 12 volts. Uh, then moving clockwise from there. Uh, looks like we've got some kind of sync signal going on there that just looks like a, uh, a pulse. Then in the middle on the bottom here, I'm getting nothing. That might be ground. Uh, and then that looks like a different pulse. So maybe horizontal and vertical sync are what we're seeing on those two. And then the last pin here in the top left, uh, that looks like a composite video signal actually. That looks about right. So top left is gonna be our composite video. And I think bottom middle is gonna be our ground. And those are gonna be the only two signals that we're gonna to need to actually get this thing working with a composite monitor, I think. To make up a new video cable for this, I'm just gonna take an old composite cable that I had and cut one end off of it. Then I'll strip it back, exposing the signal cable and the ground shield on the inside. I'll give the wires a nice twist to make them easier to work with. Then I need something to hold the DIN plug and this little board that a fellow member of the DFW Retro Computing Group gave me will do the trick perfectly. It's a neat little design with all the different DIN plug shapes cut out in it so that it can hold your DIN plug perfectly for soldering. And speaking of which, I'll go ahead and solder the two wires to the appropriate places on the plug. Then I'll crimp the strain relief onto the wire and that's when I realized I forgot to slip the casing onto the wire first. After saying a few inappropriate words, I took it all back apart and did it all over again. Finally, after it's back together, I wanna to test it with the scope to make sure I got it right and that looks excellent. The CRT that I'm gonna use for this is this PC8041A NEC character display. I bought this here in the States, so it runs on 120 volts, but it's just a standard composite CRT, and it is known good. I've used it with the TI-99 before, and it looks fantastic. Uh, so if the NEC PC8001 is going to display anything, it should show up here. Now, I don't no, I have absolutely no idea what the condition of this machine is. We do know that it's generating a video signal, so hopefully we'll see something, but there's only one way to find out. That is to flip the power switch here, and <laughs> here goes nothing. Oh, it just works? Uh, NEC PC8001 basic version 1.1, copyright 1979 by Microsoft. Okay, I don't have a keyboard hooked up, so I have... <laughs> I have no idea if the keyboard works, but that's fantastic news. That looks to be mostly working. Yes. Yeah, that's awesome. I've got the keyboard back on it, so let's take this thing for a test drive. Uh, it's just basic, so let's type up a pretty quick basic program. We'll do 10, 4i equals 1 to 10. Then we'll do 20, print. And then, well, normally my go-to is Hellorld. And if you don't know, Hellorld came about because I was trying to type in hello world in hexadecimal on the memory monitor on the Centurion. And uh, because I'm unfamiliar with hexadecimal, when I was looking down, I got to H-E-L-L-O. And when I looked down again, I picked up at the O in world, skipping the space W and O. So I ended up with 
hello world instead of hello world and that's just kind of become my go-to now that's fascinating because you can actually make the same mistake in japanese hello world would just be hello world uh, but there's two hyphens in there there's two dashes so you can actually look down and pick up at the dash in both and make the exact same mistake skipping the space and the wa so you could end up with hello world <laughs> which is the Japanese version of hello world. So let's go with that. But to type it, I'm gonna to need to push the Kana key here to get into Japanese input. And now this doesn't work like you normally think it would. You have to actually look and type the specific Kana character and it doesn't really match up how you would expect. Modern computers are much better about this so you don't have to follow the Kana layout. But we don't have a whole lot of option here so we'll just do the Kana layout here. And so that is gonna be uh, this one followed by this one and then all the way up to here and then this key this key this key and then we'll come out of Kana and we'll type an exclamation point and then we'll finish it off and there we go Harorudo. so we should print that 10 times and then we'll go 30 next I uh, and then if we list it should be exactly the same made everything uh, uppercase for us now let's run it there we go <laughs> We printed Harorudo 10 times. We have officially taken this thing for a test drive. That's pretty awesome. This thing's working excellently. Uh, I'm going to punch in a slightly more difficult program and then we'll give that a test. Okay, my uh, 7 key is apparently a little sticky. Uh, sometimes it wouldn't type, sometimes it would type double. Mechanical keyboard is probably just a little bit dirty. The more I use it, the better it should get. But everything else seems to be working really perfectly. It does take me a little while to type in Kana on this, but I do have the program typed out. Let's go ahead and run it. It should work. Uh, okay, so it says data o irenasai, which means uh, input your data. And so we're gonna just input a couple of numbers here. We'll do uh, one, two, three, four. Uh, then we'll do maybe four, three, two, one. Then we'll do five, five, six. Five, uh, and then we'll do eight. <laughs> Just a really wild one. Uh, and then if you input a zero, this should end the program. So we'll put a zero in there. And yeah, there we go. So it says uh, data su. This is the number of data entries are four, and that's correct. Uh, go k. Okay, that's the total. This is going to be all of them added together. So that comes out to eleven thousand one hundred twenty-eight. I think that's correct. I'm not fast enough to do all of that in my head. And then Haking is the average, which is 2,782. And you can see how if you get an eight on one of your test scores, that really brings the average down. <laughs> but that program worked perfectly. That is absolutely awesome. Now there's some interesting things going on at the bottom here. We have uh, HT auto go to list and run. These correspond to the F keys that are up here. So if I just hit F5, that's the same for run. That should run the program again. So if we do five, five, zero, uh, we can see, there we go. There's two data entries. The total is 10 and the average is five. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, the next one is list. So I can just hit F4 to list it out. It doesn't list it automatically. It just goes ahead and types it for me. Then I can just hit enter and do that list. F3 just types go to for me. When you're typing a ba basic program, go to is gonna be a pretty common one that you use. So having that right there is pretty nice. Uh, auto is an interesting one. So I think the way this works is you hit auto and then hit enter and it starts with 10. Now this is gonna erase my program, but we'll just do a print. Hello world. And then if I hit enter after this, it automatically types the 20 for me. That's really nice. Uh, so then we can do end and, uh, and I think, I don't know, we'll delete outside of that. I don't know how to get out of that. That's interesting. Stop. Okay. <laughs> there we go. Now we can run that one. There we go. So it turns out hit the stop button on the keyboard. I'm learning as we go along. Uh, HT is a tab, so I can hit F1 to tab around across, so that might be really important for longer programs. And then I can hold Shift, and this changes to different things. So we have Shift Time, uh, which is a syntax error. I'm not really sure how to use that. And then Shift Key, it just types key for us. Missing operand. Shift Print, and then that's how we can do our Hello World. Uh, and then finally, Shift Continue. I'm not really sure what continue means. Maybe if you have a program that's running indefinitely, you can stop and continue from there. Actually, let's try that out. Let's go 10 print hello world 20 go to 10. 
and then we'll run. And then if I hit stop, it says break in 20. Now if I hit shift continue, yeah, there we go. I'm learning with you. This is awesome. We're picking things up. <laughs> so this thing seems to be working absolutely perfectly. That is epic. I am so happy to have my PC 8001 up and running. So there is my NEC PC 8001 all the way from Akihabara, Japan running absolutely perfectly. There is one big burning question remaining though and that is what does this little perp board expansion thing do? And the answer is I have absolutely no clue whatsoever. I plugged it in, pushed the little button here. The red LED does turn on, so it's doing something, but near as I can tell, basic is not changed in any way whatsoever. It performs exactly the same. I even wrote a pretty computationally intensive program, it's on the screen right now, and timed it running both with this expansion in there and with it removed, and it runs in exactly the same time. 18 seconds, which rules out the idea that this might be some kind of clock doubler or even clock haver that uh, drops the clock speed for homebrew projects. So I have no clue what this does. It's uh, complex enough that it's doing something interesting, I believe, but not so complex that it's doing complex behavior. I mean, it's only six ICs and a push button. So uh, I think what this is going to take is quite a bit of reverse engineering. I'm going to need to reverse engineer their uh, kind of point-to-point -point wiring going on on the back here. And I'm going to need to reverse engineer what other ICs within the motherboard it touches, which means I also need to figure out what those ICs are doing. So I've got a little more work to do to figure out exactly what this is. But in the meantime, my PC8001 is running perfectly. And uh, before we go, there's one more thing that I want to mention, and I said that I wrote a pretty computationally intensive program to kind of stress test it and see if this was uh, doing something, and that program is Project Euler's question number one. This is kind of my go-to whenever I want to stress test a system, uh, and the question that it posits is, what is the sum of all numbers that are divisible by three or five below 1,000? And uh, I discovered a couple of things. One, it takes 18 seconds to run on this machine, but uh, it does get the right answer. You can see, I think it's 233,168. But uh, in basic in here actually has the modulo command built into it. That I think is pretty rare. I'm pretty sure Commodore Basic doesn't have that and you have to do some other tricky math to figure out the remainder of something instead. So that is pretty impressive for this little guy. It has a, a full-fledged Basic that has a lot of capability. The thing is humming along at four megahertz for something released in 1979, rocking 32K of DRAM. As far as home computers go, this thing knocked it out of the park. I don't understand why it wasn't more popular here in the US. I mean, they did come here, some of them did sell, but as far as I can tell, this thing is swinging up there with the best of them. Now, I haven't tested the graphical capabilities of it or the color capabilities of it because all I've got is this character display that does black and white. So maybe it was let down a little bit there, but it seems like in Japan, this thing had a massive following with a lot of software for it. But this is a fantastic little microcomputer. Now I've got the unenviable task of trying to find a place to fit it in this room. So I want to thank you guys so much for watching, and I hope to see you in the next episode.